Hi, this is Elliot Fishman, and welcome to the January 2024 CTSS Quiz. It's another year and another chance to learn. 2024. Who knows? Just yesterday, it seemed like it was 2023. Anyway, 2024 is going to be a great year, I hope, for me, for you, and for everyone. And to get it started, let's look at 10 amazing cases and let's see how well you do in this new year. In this patient with right upper quadrant pain, the most likely diagnosis is. Well, if you look at the images carefully, you see there's a mass in the liver and there's high density. That's not calcification. That means this patient had chemoembolization, had a taste study, which is fine. That's one of the ways of treating hepatoma. But then if you look carefully, there's actually bleeding from the tumor. The tumor has ruptured or the capsule has ruptured. Now we talk about bleeding in the liver, we talk about hepatic adenomas, we talk about hepatoma, we talk about metastasis, but one of the things that bleeds and one of the complications of taste is rupture of the capsule of the liver with active bleeding, which you can see very nicely in this case. In many ways, there are a few sort of correct answers, right? Hepatoma. This was a hepatoma. This patient did have post-embolization. You can see the taste. The patient did not have TB. I put that in there just because I wanted to fool you if you want to be fooled based on the calcification. But this was rupture of the tumor with active bleeding. A really terrific case. The most likely diagnosis in this middle-aged patient with abdominal pain is, well, we look at the images, and you can see the bowel looks okay. Kidneys, as visualized, look okay, as does the liver. But when you look at the axial views, there's a linear line through the SMA, which is better seen on the sagittal views. That's a dissection of the patient's SMA. I don't see ischemic bowel. This could be vasculitis. There are a number of causes for SMA dissection, from trauma to procedures to vasculitis. You can see with fibromuscular dysplasia, for example, and other vasculitis. You can see it with SAM. It's not something you're going to see with Crohn's disease, but the best diagnosis in this case is C, SMA dissection, a really nice example. The least likely diagnosis in this case of an incidental adrenal mass is, well, we see a right-sided adrenal mass. It's maybe minimally vascular, but not very vascular. It has a well-defined border. Contralateral adrenal looks good. I don't see anything else in the abdomen. There's no liver meds. There's no adenopathy. So what am I thinking about? Well, this could be an adenoma, but the wall thickening and the higher density within it makes it really impossible for me to say it's a simple adenoma, but it could be. Pheochromocytomas are usually more vascular, but not every pheo is going to be hypervascular. Myelolipomas typically contain fat, but it's variable. Some myelolipomas are all fat. Some are almost no fat, but little dots. But if you look and you say the least likely diagnosis, I would have to say adrenal carcinoma. It's too well defined, borders too sharp. Now, adrenal cortical carcinoma ranges from 3 to 20 centimeters. In functioning tumors, it can, in fact, be smaller. It can look almost like an adenoma. But in this case, if you ask me for the best diagnosis, I would say a lesion that previously bled. And in fact, this was an adrenal adenoma that previously bled, but I would say the least likely diagnosis would be a primary adrenal cortical carcinoma. What about this case? In this febrile patient with diarrhea, what's the most likely diagnosis? When you look at the colon, you see the ascending colon, the descending colon, and sigmoid colon are all thickened. It's essentially a pan colitis. When you're looking at particularly the descending and sigmoid colon, it has what I would call an accordion shape to it that is classically described in patients with pseudomembranous colitis. This could be ischemic colitis in theory, but it's too extensive, quite frankly. 
Graham Furness's host disease usually involves a small bowel with more thickening. It doesn't have the look of GVH, and you would know about that from the history, perhaps. This does not look like lymphoma. Lymphoma can involve the large bowel, but not so extensive, but the pattern doesn't look like lymphomatous infiltration. This is a classic case of pseudomembranous colitis. The patient had previously been on antibiotics, which explains the story. The most likely diagnosis in a middle-aged female is, well, there's a big mass in the left adrenal gland. It's solid and it's necrotic. The borders are not well defined. It's pushing down and even possibly invading the upper pole of the patient's left kidney. There's no liver lesions. There's nothing else going on. There are small periodic nodes present. So what's the best diagnosis? Well, pheochromocytomas are typically vascular. At times they can be cystic, but this looks not like typical pheo or even an uncommon pheo, but it's a thought. This is not a liposarcoma. Sometimes you can get liposarcomas pushing into the adrenal bed, simulating a myelolipoma even. Doesn't look like that. This is not the look of an adenoma with bleed. This looks like an aggressive tumor. It's an infiltrating tumor. And the best diagnosis is primary adrenal cortical carcinoma. Just a very classic example. The most likely primary tumor with this pattern of liver metastasis is, well, if we look at the liver, the patient has widespread metastasis, but they're vascular. What gives you vascular mets? Well, it's not lymphoma, and it's not non-small cell lung cancer. Those are typically hypovascular. Similarly, melanoma is most commonly hypovascular, though occasionally can have increased vascularity, but not to this extent. This is typically going to be a neuroendocrine tumor. And in fact, when you look carefully at the study, there's a mass in the tail of the pancreas with calcification. This was indeed a peanut pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor. Just a very classic, classic example. In this 40-ish year old female, the most likely diagnosis is, well, I see a mass in the anterior mediastinum. It's solid and it has some calcification. It's somewhat eccentric. This could be lymphoma. Lymphoma can calcify usually after treatment, but I don't see any other mass in this patient. It could be a teratoma. Teratomas can indeed calcify, but they have more coarse calcifications, and usually it's not in 40-year-olds. Substernal thyroid, this is not substernal thyroid. This is an anterior mediastinal mass. The best diagnosis, an eccentric anterior mediastinal mass with calcification is a thymic tumor. Now, this could be a thymoma, this could also be a thymic carcinoma. And in fact, this was a thymic carcinoma. It's, it's often impossible to tell them apart. Again, eccentric mass, occasionally with calcification, thymic tumors are a very good choice. The most likely diagnosis in this case is, well, what do we see? A large anterior mediastinal mass with trabeculation with coarse calcifications or ossifications, but it's growing through the chest wall. This is a very aggressive tumor. Lymphomas can calcify post-radiation, but that would be a very unusual appearance of them growing through the chest wall, and I don't see any hyalur disease. That's unlikely. It could be a teratoma. Teratomas have dystrophic calcification, but exceedingly rare to grow through the chest wall. I have seen a case of thymoma do this, but it's a case of thymoma that was radiated and the patient then developed an osteosarcoma. We published this case last year, in fact. And the fourth choice is chondrosarcoma. Chondrosarcomas can occur in the anterior mediastinum. They have this chondroid matrix. They extend through the chest wall. And this was an excellent example of a chondrosarcoma. So we talk about anterior mediastinal masses, three T's and an L, teratoma, thymoma, substernal thyroid, and lymphoma. 
None of those usually grow through the chest wall, though lymphoma can, but then you see more spread of disease. Just the anterior metastinal mass and this appearance, you better think of something like a chondrosarcoma, or if the patient had prior radiation therapy, the possibility of an angiosarcoma or other aggressive tumor would need to be considered. In this patient five years post-cardiac transplant, the most likely diagnosis is, well, when you look at the images, you see multiple liver masses. So that's tumor. This tumor also in the spleen. There is then bulky tumor infiltration of the distal small bowel, the ileum, and maybe even the cecum. So now we see multifocal disease. Without the history, I still would think of lymphoma. I would throw in melanoma. Could be adenocarcinoma, a bulky adeno of the small bowel with liver mets, but splenic mets would be unusual. However, in this case, I told you the patient had a cardiac transplant. What you have to worry about is post-transplant lymphoproliferative syndrome, which is what this patient had. They had a B-cell lymphoma, and sure enough, liver, splenic, and bowel involvement, a very classic case. This doesn't have the look of adenocarcinoma. It's not carcinoids, which are typically vascular with desmoplastic reaction and vascular liver mets. Melanoma, it could be. Only because melanoma could be almost anything. It involves a small bowel. It can involve multiple solid organs. But I think the history of cardiac transplant has to push you to B-cell lymphoma. The most likely diagnosis in this case is well, what do I see? First of all, I see multiple vascular renal masses, multiple renal cell carcinomas. I then see a vascular lesion off the tail of the pancreas, and I see cystic lesions in the pancreas. So what must I be dealing with? Well, I could be dealing with a renal cell carcinoma that could give you bilateral disease and meds to the pancreas, but you know, you have cystic lesions in the pancreas as well. Hard to explain that. Lymphoma, typically lymphoma involving the kidneys, which is usually bilateral like this case, are usually hypovascular. They may involve the peri and pararenal space, so I don't like that as a possibility. Neurogenic tumors, I put that in just so you'd think about syndromes, but this is not the look of neurofibromatosis. And neurofibromatosis, one, there's no paraspinal lesions. What is this then? Well, it's von Hippel-Lindau disease. Von Hippel-Lindau disease gives you single or multiple clear cell renal cell carcinomas. It's common to get neuroendocrine tumors of the pancreas. It's common to get pancreatic cysts, and it's also common to get pheochromocytomas. There are other things as well, but those are the most common things. And so this case was von Hippel-Lindau with multiple renal cells, pancreatic neuroendocrine tumor, and pancreatic cysts. What a terrific case. And with that, let's call it a day. Those were 10 terrific cases. Hopefully, you got them all right. But more importantly, hopefully, you learned something from looking at them. And with that, I hope January is just a wonderful start to a wonderful year of 2024. See you later, guys. If you like this video, make sure to subscribe to the CTSS YouTube channel. You can also visit us at ctss.com for even more videos, plus quizzes, pearls, protocols, and oh so much more. We're also in the App Store and have well over a dozen apps for iPhone and iPad, all completely free. Thanks for watching.